I will just have everyone start to uh, introduce yourselves and, uh, and some of the works that you have both with us and, and just in the world right now. Yeah, hi, I'm Adam Newhouse. I work for ESPN Films, primarily on the 30 for 30 series. So I help lead development for the features, the shorts, and the podcast series for 30 for 30. And at the festival, we have a, a wonderful short film called Mac Wrestles, which I would encourage everyone to see. Um, and uh, overall, um, just all things 30 for 30. Hi, I'm Christine Kecker. Uh, I work for a and &E Indie Films, and we commission a documentary features and shorts for Lifetime, History, and a and &E. uh, We have a short at the festival called Learning to Skateboard in a War Zone if you're a girl. So the title pretty much explains what it's about. And um, yeah, so that's by director Carol Dysinger, and um, it should be going up um, on VOD and digital in the next month. So um, We'll get into how we distribute shorts, I'm sure, but uh, yeah, so all things documentary at A&E. Hey, good morning, I'm Ryan Harrington and I work with National Geographic Documentary Films. We're a fairly new division um, where we are commissioning, acquiring, um, and developing a small slate of feature and short films uh, that will be released globally every year on multiple platforms. Um, we start with festivals, expand uh, into theaters for theatrical runs, um, where things then trickle onto our digital and linear platforms, and soon Disney Plus and Hulu. Um, we have two shorts here at the film festival. Uh, the first is The Night Crawlers, directed by Alexander Mora and produced by Joanna Natasagara. Uh, which looks at the, the Duterte's uh, drug wars in the Philippines. Um, and the other is a short called Lost and Found by Orlando von Einseidel, uh, which looks at um, a lost and found for children in a Rohingya a refugee camp in Bangladesh. Uh, both of those shorts will be released digitally around the world um, on November the 15th. Uh, and I'm Lindsay Krauss. I'm a producer for OpDocs, which is the short documentary series from the opinion section of the New York Times. Um, we've been around since 2011, and we've published um, probably roughly 350 short um, nonfiction films by independent filmmakers from all around the world, both um, independent, uh, sorry, both emerging and um, established, like everyone from someone in college to um, you know Oscar winners like Errol Morris. Um, anyone can contribute to our page, uh, to our to our films. Uh, we have two short films on the shortlist this year here. Um, uh, one is called Tungrus. It's a story of a middle class family in, um, in Bombay who's um, it's kind of like the patriarch of the family, brings home a chicken one day and it's their pet for a while and it's kind of annoying. And then um, at the end of the day, uh, I'll give it away, but you should still watch it because it's like the, the um, it's all about watching it um, and kind of how they talk about it, but they decide to eat, he decides to eat it. Um, and so it's just like a really interesting interrogation of um, kind of what's a pet and what is our food um, when it's all when they're all animals. And the other is a, um, a film called Stay Close, which is about a, um, a, a young man's um, unlikely ascent to the Olympics in the sport of fencing. Okay, uh, so of course we are talking about the golden age uh, of shorts right now, and specifically our focus is on the fact that. Uh, there's just been such an explosion in terms of platforms for short filmmakers um, to not only have platforms for their work to be seen, but also creative partners in uh, getting their work made. Uh, could you each speak to that, uh, both in terms of uh, how things used to be, maybe even just looking back like five, 10 years ago, and what you've seen in, in the um, change, both on your platforms and, and the industry at large? Um, yeah, I, I think it's never been a better time, I, you know, using the phrase golden age. I mean, I still think shorts has, has to fight for uh, every dollar, you know, that gets commissioned and every view that it gets. I still think there's this kind of weird disconnect because, you know, at all the film festivals I go to, all the short screening blocks are full and people like really enjoy seeing five or six different stories in a block. Um, and the films are universally creative and clever and up and coming talent and all these things. Um, but I, I just haven't seen the, the kind of 
ease of like, here's a marketplace where people are watching very consistently shorts, mm -hmm. which is a little interesting to me. I think, uh, you know, if everything is about more short form and attention spans are shorter and, you know, I just wonder um, if there will be a place that or if it's a behavior that's being built and that'll be it will be a viable business thing or it will always just be this kind of artistic little realm. I wonder what you guys think as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of I agree that I don't know if I would call it the golden age. Okay. I think that it's um, the age of, of, of new opportunity, um, okay. certainly as there are new platforms coming up as, as large companies like Adam and mine, um, our companies emerging, uh, being bought by Disney. Um, so people are looking for films um, and consuming films differently. For, for, for the work that I'm doing at Nat Geo, it really is, I'm not looking at the difference between short form and features. It's really just how the best stories that come to us and what form they're in. Um, you know, the night crawlers, for instance, that is a better short for us because um, if we, when we looked at it and considered it as a feature, it would take two or three years to make. Yeah. This is an urgent story. It has right. to come out now. So it enables us to kind of to, to branch out a bit and tell stories um, quicker um, and release them differently and experiment a bit with them. And it also enables us to work with um, filmmakers that might not, you know, we're, I only do three or four features a year. So it's very c competitive, very selective. Um, and there are a lot of boxes that you have to tick. For shorts, it helps us work with more emerging filmmakers, filmmakers from diverse backgrounds, international filmmakers. So, you know, they serve a lot of different purposes for us. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in this unknown world of distribution that is changing every day, it helps us remain nimble. Um, speaking from the perspective of the New York Times, the um, op docs and the short, short docs that we have been able to, to bring to the Times have been tremendously successful just because they're really accomplishing what um, traditional written journalism, print journalism, um, just really can't, or even photojournalism can't do. Um, and it's really enabled us to tell stories in a really robust way that there was really absolutely no way to do um, at the New York Times before. Um, and so that's been tremendously exciting for us. I mean, you, and this has happened for us in a number of different realms. So for example, there was a film maybe two years ago about the refugee crisis called 4.1 Miles, and the filmmaker just stayed with um, a, um, a Greek Coast Guard captain for um, for one day as he was kind of charged with either letting the refugees that were crossing the channel to his small Greek island die or to save them. And we he decided to save them, and so we were just like in the boat with him. If you'd written that out or even taken pictures of it, it would not have had the same, same effect. And so that was really, really amazing for us to be able to bring that to our viewers and kind of inspire the outrage that such a crisis warranted. Um, there's also films like, we had published a film called Birth Control Your Own Adventure, which was just like a 21-year-old girl, young woman hanging out after college, just like thinking back about her experience with endometriosis and um, and all the different kinds of birth controls that she'd taken over the years to, to deal with it and about all the symptoms that she'd had. And we could have absolutely just published that essay. It was, um, you know, just brilliantly written, um, so funny, so clever, so smart. Um, but she accompanied it with this amazing stop motion animation that I think just really elevated her arguments and really drew a viewer in in a way that we couldn't even come up with that on our own. Um, it really, it was amazing to be able to like provide that forum to a girl who, a young woman who, you know, didn't really feel like she had a career yet and didn't really feel like she had a voice yet. And um, by contributing these short docs, um, she was able to really get herself out there and build the audience that she'd always sought to, to um, achieve. Um, I'll just say, you know, from the A&E perspective, in terms of putting things on the air, a 40-minute short is actually not that unfamiliar in the television world because it fits into an hour, you know, special time okay, slot so on TV. Yeah. So from that perspective, it, it isn't as much of a challenge. What's actually exciting is that, um, you know, after it's aired on TV, um, where does it go after that? There are so many new partners that we can, you know, it, the film can have a second life on Netflix after it airs on A&E or Lifetime. So, you know, and I think on Netflix or the, all the new platforms, Disney Plus, you know, Apple Plus, people are going to be much more, they're much more agnostic about the length of something that they're about to watch as opposed to being 
told that this is a short or you know deciding to watch a short you're just deciding to watch something because you're interested in the topic and the length really doesn't matter so in that sense i agree with ryan it's just about quality content whatever length it may be and that's so much more possible now than it used to be so it really is exciting just to find new filmmakers who we're able to work with because it is harder to you know feature length docs are much more expensive they're not as nimble as you said so in a in a way it's um maybe it is the golden age something's definitely happening so <laughs> good answer can i ask you a question sure. you've seen probably more shorts than all of us you program tons of festivals Thank what you. have you noticed last couple of years in the su types of submissions you're getting uh there is a lot of work that's very responsive to um, issues at hand. Uh, Ryan, your point about being nimble to subject uh, just made me think about the fact that, I mean, every year, you know, obviously after the 2016 election, I knew I was gonna have a glut of, you know, uh, election, not just process, but people's responses, and sure enough, that was the case. You know, with the Syria refugee crisis, I knew. So I always know, given what's going on at any given time in uh, current affairs, there's going to be uh, a concentrated number of stories responding to that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, a question, though, that I had about how you go about choosing your, uh, which, which artists you want to, or, or uh, filmmakers you want to work with, um, talk about that process, how you're um, either selecting projects when you're acquiring or um, when you're commissioning, uh, choosing which, which filmmakers you want to collaborate with. Oh. <laughs> I, I can start, I guess we can go this way. Um, so I guess for us, we're, we're looking for a variety of topics that are done in a really, really um, authentic way. And so we're not picking by filmmaker first, generally speaking. Like, I don't care if you've won an Oscar. I don't care what your name is. Um, I'm definitely not asking you what your background is um, when you're submitting. What I'm hoping is that that comes through in the work that you're doing and that your connection to the work um, is really, really um, showing in your approach. Um, for example, I'm always kind of, you can kind of tell if someone is from a country um, that they're trying to portray and in the portrayal by the way that they're portraying the subject. Um, for example, Tungus, the film that I was talking about, about the chicken, I don't think that I could have just showed up in Bombay and found that story of a middle class family like adopting a chicken and then, you know, what happened next. Like, I just really don't think that would have been possible as um, a white person from New York City. Uh, I mean, unless I, unless I basically like move. Basically, I just don't really think that would be possible. But the filmmaker was another Indian um, who was from Bombay, and he had a family. Uh, he had a coworker who was talking about his cousin whose family had adopted this chicken. Um, and so he was like, "Oh, I'm gonna go make a film about that." <laughs> and so I think like in that way, that really that worked for us. It's like then we found a filmmaker who was certainly not on the international um, documentary scene. Like he can't afford to come here for to promote his film. It's um, qualified for an Oscar, we're trying to back it as much as we can. But in that way, it felt like we were really diversifying our filmmaker base almost without even trying to. And so again, we're not looking for the filmmakers first, we're looking for this amazing film that really surprises us, and often that's from finding surprising filmmakers. Yeah, I mean, for us, I, I, we, I mean, we're, we're very new to the shorts game. Mm -hmm. um, we announced our, our shorts initiative I think in, in August, this, this past August. So we're, we're right now, the shorts for us are more of an acquisitions play. Um, and we really, I mean, everyone knows the Nat Ge National Geographic magazine. Our grandparents know it. Um, it's something we all grew up with. Um, and hopefully um, our kids and, and their kids will, will continue to grow up with that. So we're looking, you know, our, our kind of what we're looking for in terms of any type of story is we say, um, you know, we're looking for stories um, that help us understand the world and our place in it. So it, it's stories that really deepen our understanding of where we are in the world. Um, so th for us, it's story first and foremost. We're looking at the filmmaker. If it's a, if, if you're a new or an emerging filmmaker, um, such as Alex, who did the Nightcrawlers as his first film, we uh, you know he he was paired with Joanna Nata Segura, who who won the Oscar for um, the White Helmets, uh, which was a short um, on Netflix, Netflix did a few years back. Um, and then we have um, another you know Orlando von Einsiedel made our other short. He's an Oscar winner. So we're really looking for 
Um, we don't want to work only with a list. We want to be working with new. So it's just a matter of kind of really balancing that slate. When we do so few, though, um, all of the films get um, a lot of attention. Um, you know, we have our communications and marketing team and uh, distributors and, and, and consultants. So every film is surrounded by their own team and each has its own strategy. So, um, you know, we are, um, it's funny, my boss says, we are a boutique, not a department store. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really is, you know, we're, we're small, but we're mean. And we, we put a lot of behind what we do. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'll just talk a little bit. It's a being at a network, you know, um, the impetus for what we're making at any given time can come from, you know, very different places. For example, um, learning to skateboard in a war zone started because the founder of the organization featured in the film, um, Oliver Perkovich, did a talk at a &E, and someone in the marketing department was like, you need to make this into a short doc. And Lifetime happened to be, at that time, commissioning short documentaries um, with you know female driven content which they had never done before so it was sort of this magical matching of you know timing and a need um, for content and when we you know went to make that film there really aren't that many female directors who are experienced working in afghanistan so we found carol she's made films there before she has a guggenheim fellowship to work in the country so she was the perfect match um, and you know now what's happening um, at the network is that A&E is looking to, they're like, we want to expand into new voices and people we've never seen before. So I think a, there's now going to be a big push to find content from, you know, people who may not be from New York or LA and <laughs> be regional filmmakers and things like that. So, you know, also with the network, you do have a brand. And so that's always a consideration of, um, you know, what fits with our brand at this time so that, you know, when we lead into it with a different show, um, is, is the audience going to stay and are they going to be interested in the content? So there's a lot of considerations, but at the end of the day, a good story or a good character is, e it's an easy sell and everybody is going to, you know, rally to it. So, so that's kind of our process. Yeah. 30 for 30 is primarily a historical archival based, you know, uh, series. So we mostly do features and we're mostly looking for bigger features that we can get the whole ESPN machine behind. So I think in our shorts program is similar to kind of Ryan's in that, you know, the good thing about uh, what we have at 30 for 30 is a story can come in and we have a lot of levers. So we could say this is a feature, this is a long feature like OJ. This is a series for ESPN Plus. This is a short film this is a 30 for 30 podcast so we have that ability to kind of look at the story first and then figure out uh, where it goes I think filmmaker is important for us it does not necessarily mean you have to have uh, a long resume to have done stuff but I always say you know it's like uh, you know Errol Morris or you know somebody of that stature could sell something based off a one-line pitch if you're pitching me something and you have a, a resume that's not as lengthy, then you should know that story inside and out. You should be connected to that story in a way that you're the only person to do it. And then we're happy to do exactly, again, what Ryan said as well, like we will partner you or, or figure out a way to create a, a system around you um, to help you succeed if we really love the story and we believe in your talent. Again, this industry only works if we put, you know, reach our hands down and help the kind of next generation come up for storytelling. So I think we're we're all about that. In terms of the types of stories, I think for shorts, we're allowed a little bit more leeway. Um, Mac wrestles is a verite story. We normally don't do that at all. Thirty for thirty is about the kind of context and perspective that a little bit of time provides. Um, but I think urgent social issues with sports as a prism matters. And so um, this was a great story about a transgender wrestler from Texas. So we felt like we had to uh, get involved. But the other short we have this year, and we only have two, so it's again kind of a bespoke business for us, uh, was a filmmaker that we've been really interested in whose name is Theo Anthony, uh, who did a film called Rat Film. Um, and so he pitched, uh, he pitched us an idea uh, that's kind of a, 
It's a tone poem about the nature of instant replay as told through the Hawkeye camera used in tennis. <laughs> so wow. it is like <laughs> <a> super <laughs> out there, but it's it's amazing. It's about truth and justice. It's you know it's about data. It's I mean it's a really fascinating uh, project, and that was a hundred percent because of the filmmaker. We right. wanted to work with him. So um, I think moving forward, you know, we'll be in the same boat. Maybe two or three a year. I definitely think we will be looking for those kind of urgent social issues just sure. because it always seems like the film festivals and the kind of audiences kind of want that but uh, we always just want to be open for you know tone poems or whatever <laughs> I really want to watch the, that I, I'd <laughs> say really cool. that's the first time I'm hearing that uh, vocab word of the day um, so I'm hearing threads of um, the, your your uh, interest being story driven um, you know as well as uh, looking at certain artists that you want to uh, give platform to. I'm interested to hear a bit more about audience. Adam, you just touched on that a bit uh, with respect to festivals. Um, share with us about how the factor of audience comes in. Um, are you, I know, uh, Lindsay, you guys are at festivals a lot, like looking to see uh, what hits. Um, is it about where the film is playing? Is it about how the audience responds? if it gets uh, awards or anything like that. Talk about um, audience in, in the, um, the consideration factors then. Um, I think for the times we have the, uh, just to make sure I understand your question, do you mean in terms of how we're considering um, programming it or how we um, connect it to our audience or both? I'd say both. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of what we acquire, we are just generally looking for films that surprise us um, and really, really intrigue us. And I mean, I think just like you, we're probably watching so many submissions that for example, you, you mentioned um, the 2016 election or the refugee crisis in, um, in the Mediterranean or the Middle East um, a, a few years ago. It's like, we probably got, I would say, I mean, it, it probably wouldn't be an exaggeration to say like 400 films on each of those topics. Mm -hmm. um, we publish about 40 a year. We really just want to publish like the one or maybe the two. And if they're, we're publishing the two, they have to be approaching it from really, really different perspectives. And it, I think as a filmmaker, that can be hard to remember, um, but it actually is a really, really worthwhile North Star um, when you're making your film is why is my film the film on this topic? Like why is this the film that's gonna be like the defining film on this topic? That's a hard thing to do, but that's always what we're looking for is the one that's really gonna break through and become like the defining Finding film of that, um, you know, really important theme, um, especially because in the, at the times we do have really great uh, journalism. So, uh, why is the film being different? Um, because also in terms of how we reach our audience, as soon as your film becomes a part of the Times, it is becoming part of our like broader journalistic platform. We are putting sort of what I hope is sort of the, the prestige of the Times on your film um, from a from a storytelling perspective. And so we're premiering it on the homepage of the New York Times and then putting it out on all of our channels, um, you know, putting it in all of our bureaus around the world and having them put it out on their um, on the on their platforms. You know, what, whether it's like a health film or a, um, a film that requires like a foreign bureau, like we're vetting it through those people and then having them promote it. So it's like once you're part of the Times, we're using everything that the Times has to reach its audience um, and trying to get them to get as excited about it as possible. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's great. I'm just, I'm kind of amazed at how many shorts you do every year. Um, <laughs> Wow, 40. Um, so for us, you know, our, it's all intertwined. It's a, it's a, this is a, it's a, it's a, a, a difficult, it's a great question, but it, for us it all works together. You know, uh, Nat Geo Documentary Films was established to really kind of put a halo and brand building over the Nat Geo brand and, and put us in places that um, the linear television uh, um, channel could never. Um, so for us, we really, really rely, I mean, the, at the end of the day, the goal is audience, but it's also a num number of other things. We premiere at film festivals to get national and global press. See, you know, there, it's shorts are difficult enough to see. The festivals provide a platform, one of the only platforms for people to ingest the work. And from that becomes press, especially when you launch major film festivals around the world. Um, so that's kind of step one. Step two um, is, you know, impact campaigns. So all of our films, you know, most of these films deal with some sort of issue um, affecting the world that we live in. So we, we 
invest and work with partners on impact campaigns. We, you know, we're with Lost and Found, we're working with the Nobel Prize. Um, so they'll be screening the film around the world. Right. So right. that's kind of that's kind of target audience and audience engagement, audience building for the people that actually really care about the issues. Mm -hmm. And then from there, that bleeds into awards campaigns because if you're film at festivals, you're targeting the documentary community, the, you know, the circle of people that you care about, that care about the issue, that are part of the community. Um, and they, you know, when you begin to uh, awards, and let's face it, these are, we're all interested in awards because they build your brand. Right. They, they garner, you know, a halo effect for the work that you do, that your colleagues do, that land on other platforms. And so it all kind of bleeds together. And the goal of that is to hopefully, when it airs on the network or it airs on Hulu or streams on Hulu or on our digital platforms, all of those things together will help bring new eyeballs to the film. I know that's a really long-winded no, no, answer, but it all really is, it's all, you know, they, they're all tied together. I, well, sense. thank you for admitting that we care about awards. <laughs> it's a little taboo to talk about in a strange way, but I actually think that's part of the reason shorts are having a little bit of a golden age is that, you know, the competition, quite frankly, for features is so difficult and mm -hmm. people started to notice, hey, there's this other important category that can also catapult a director into a all the statues look the same. <laughs> all, statues all the same. statues look the it's same. Me. <laughs> you, you, you don't get a short Oscar. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. But I think you you said a lot of what I would have said. So I don't have too much to add to that. But um, yeah, certainly there are festivals. The you know, the TV network audience are are in a way very different considerations, and then of course your secondary platform like a Hulu or whatever streamer you go on. So um, there's a lot to think about for sure. Well, Ryan and I are contractually obligated to remind you that Disney Plus launches on Tuesday, <laughs> <laughs> so it's part of the bundle. It's a really great deal. So we're we've now fulfilled that. And but Disney you is know, our <laughs> yeah. it's kind owned of by Disney. Owned by Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Big aircraft carrier. So, you know, uh, ESPN, obviously, we, we're almost entirely brand Halo for 30 for 30. I mean, live sports, I like to say, is the cheat code of television. Um, and ESPN every day between, you know, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. is just different configurations of the same show of two people or three people talking about sports and arguing about it and then the live game at night. So, you know, for us, it is all the things Ryan said, it's about community, it's about national press, it's about bringing you know, deep storytelling to what the basis of our company is, which is, which is live sports. So um, we commission uh, our films, um, and we, we haven't done as many acquisitions, but in terms of audience, we're just, uh, the good thing is when ESPN pulls the lever, you know, our short film, Mac Wrestles, that's airing, you know, we got that to air on ABC on Sunday afternoon. You know, and it's probably for a short film that's as big an audience as you're gonna get. Yeah. You know, so that's the kind of advantage that that we have that we can that we use. Um, but most of it is is gauged towards film festivals, the doc community, and hopefully spurring people to think about uh, sports docs and then bring those pitches to us. Absolutely. Um, how is the how is the festival space um, unique? to your um, engagement with, with filmmakers or with industry. I know, you know, from, from our standpoint, um, I have much more involvement with you guys since the shortlist being launched, right? And that's, you know, candidly around uh, the award season and, you know, garnering that kind of platform. But aside from that, right, not every festival uh, has that sort of a, a space developed. Um, how how are festivals uh, useful in this in this progress or process? Excuse me, for you. I'm interested to know how many film festivals each of you attended this year. <laughs> um, I attended, I think, four and meant to go to five. No, maybe maybe six and meant to go to seven. I um, with Opdocs, I tried to. Well, with Opdocs, we've only been two people for this past year, so a little. At, we um, our executive producer moved on. Kathleen Lingo moved on to another role within the Times, and so it's been um, Andrew Blackwell and me for this year. And we just re um, just 
uh, um, kind of restocked our team. So we're a bit, a bit, a bit of a transition, but um, we like to um, divide ourselves between like sort of the huge film festivals and then um, smaller regional ones because that's actually sometimes where we find um, some more filmmakers that aren't necessarily like the usual suspects um, sure. and get, kind of have those conversations that make people feel like even though they may not be like one of the huge filmmakers um, that they can still make, maybe send something to the New York Times. I don't know, I've probably been to 10 festivals wow. so far. It's eight, 10? I lost count. I don't know, it's all a blur. Um, but yeah, I think festivals for us are, are everything. Um, you know, we are trying to bring creative storytellers to our brand. Um, we're trying to, you know, real documentary filmmakers. We're not looking for a one-off type filmmaker situation. Right. We're looking for career filmmakers. Um, so for us to find, those filmmakers are at film festivals and they're making the films and we come here to scout new talent. Uh, we come to showcase our films. We come to hopefully buy films. So for us, it really is the the, the cornerstone of what we're doing. It's, 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 it's the, the, the really the, the heart and the soul of, of, our, of our doc films banner. Yeah, I think I'm a, at about 10 also. Um, and actually, funnily, we met for the first time because you programmed my husband short at Nantucket. It's so a small, small world, world, people. <laughs> it's a small world. Um, but I would say, you know, um, if anyone's a filmmaker in the audience, go to the regional festivals because a lot of industry goes, it's a much smaller crowd and industry folks actually have more time to watch films at those festivals and mm -hmm. to watch like if there's a pitch panel, we'll go to those. So it's really, we even went to one in the Berkshires that we had never been to before, Berkshire International Film Festival. And I couldn't believe how many filmmakers live up there, how much industry showed up. So you know, just a little piece of advice yeah, if you're thinking when it's about like it. a nice place. You can, when film, when we're relaxed <laughs> and everyone is accessible and you're having a nice dinner and drinks and it's, everyone is together. The, like, you know, the Hamptons, Nantucket, the Berkshires, these lovely regional festivals are really, Camden is a great documentary festival, yeah. are really great places to go because you can actually meet people and establish relationships. And it's, you know, it's more than a pitch. It's, it's actually a hello, um, nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, I would absolutely second that. that yeah. It's just really, really fun. Um, and that's a great way to <laughs> develop goodwill. Yeah. Uh, I'll echo everyone else. Like we, we try to really balance going to the bigger ones, but then also trying to really seek out, especially uh, regional outside of the Northeast. You know, it's also nice when I can, yeah, make the plea to my bosses that I have to go somewhere, you know, <laughs> in order to meet new filmmakers. Uh, but, but I think it is important. I think you have to get, you know, I always tell people development doesn't happen behind a computer. You know, you have to go out and shake people's hands and go see their work and, you know, see and talk to them. And I, I just think it's really important that we all travel those places and, and are accessible in that way so that we can answer questions. And a lot of time for me, it's about, you know, some people say, oh, I'm not a sports fan. And I'm like, that's great. I don't need a filmmaker who's a sports fan. I need a storyteller who right. finds a story. So, you know, uh, for me, a lot of time it's just planting that seed in as many filmmakers as possible. And then, you know, six months later, they'll call me up. Hey, I think I found this thing. And that's, that's kind of my favorite moment when, you know, a trip that happened, you know, um, down the line kind of produces something else. But, you know, for us, like, if we don't have a film at Sundance, we're not going to Sundance because we feel like those films will play other places. We're not really in acquisition. So for us, you know, those regional festivals uh, are, are a better fit. So I'm going to give plugs to Indie Memphis, uh, Milwaukee Film Festival, uh, Cleveland International Film Festival. I've been to all of them thoroughly impressed with the regional uh, filmmakers I met down there. So I've if you guys... Big Sky as well, but I've never been. I haven't been to Big Sky. It's amazing. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if anybody here is programming Maui or <laughs> Copenhagen <laughs> or, you know, wh wherever we can talk. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> uh is there anything that you would like to be doing um, with your platform, with short form, that you're not doing now? Um, you know, I'm really in awe of what they do over at FOV, for instance, um, and the very strong auteur voices that they foster and encourage there. Always a really interesting slate of short form documentary, like, but very art forward work coming out of there. Um, is, is other folks 
like that, see, doing things that you think is interesting? And is there anything that you would like to be doing with the short form that you're not doing right now? Um, I think one thing that we're thinking about doing more, we did um, a series of uh, films about uh, Mexico by Mexican filmmakers, and I would love to expand that to more kind of like a film about a thing by people that are in this thing. Um, I think places are a great way to do that, especially places that you know might, necess might not necessarily be um, uh, portrayed um, as authentically as we could continue to try to do that at the New York Times, um, trying to get filmmakers from a place to portray their place, or filmmakers like that connect to a certain issue to portray that issue for us. Um, it's hard to do. Like any time for us that we narrow something, since we don't really commission, um, we're really reliant on the pitches that we get around that topic. But I think kind of really showcasing a place or an issue or some sort of topic um, from filmmakers that connect to that issue would be a really um, Timesian type uh, project to take on. Um, I'll say uh, for right now, because we're fairly early in our journey with shorts, we have mostly done um, shorts that were commissioned specifically to go on air, which means they have to be a certain length, usually 40 minutes, which is basically as long as they can be uh, to still count as a short. Um, and they're harder to program, I'm sure Opal will they attest. They are. I'm sorry. But it's <laughs> true. <laughs> um, so uh, we're looking at doing more um, digital-only pieces. For example, Biography uh, has pieces that they do that only go on AETV.com that are short bios. And so looking at doing more premium shorts um, in that realm and things like that. So just using the platforms we have more creatively rather than only uh, doing things in certain, you know, lengths for broadcast. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, the s same with us. I think I, I love the OpDoc site. I, it's, the films are so accessible. ESPN site, films are so accessible. HBO. I think it's creating something like that for Nat Geo mm -hmm. so people have a destination um, rather than having to sift through our site to find the content. It would be, you know, creating some sort of home uh, for docs on Nat Geo. I would like us to make more, you know, I think that's, I'm always battling internally to make more. I want to make weirder, more abstract, you know, real, I want to make artsy, artsy, exactly, <laughs> stuff like Time that. Uh, you know, we're also um, been experimenting a little bit and as in none have quite worked out, but thinking about stories as a constellation, you know, can there be, you know, uh, can we do a feature and a short and a podcast that all take the story at a different angle with different auteurs? That's interesting. Can we kind of own a moment and try to do a combo podcast and a short? Um, so I'm always interested in, in figuring out um, you know, because I think what's amazing now is you see a topic come out. We were just talking about Ryan was a producer on the Bikram podcast, which I mean, film, which is on Netflix. But we at ESPN had done a, a five hour 30 for 30. And, you know, and when we had done OJ, there was the scripted and the, and the, and the, the documentary. So I just think now we're going to have these multiple. It's so multiverse. true. It's when our companies like ours that have so many resources and all these different facets it's you know when if i can make a short and have the mag is Geo magazine write an article yeah. on it and it, it, we, you know that we can cross pollinate that's really a home run yeah. you know as long as it's organic i think sometimes Absolutely. when people right. try yeah. to okay we need 10 parts let's stretch it i think one of the things we're very cognizant of is a film should be as long as it needs to be mm -hmm. and the same for the amount of parts and not a minute longer and and you know, hopefully with some more flexibility and times that, you know, you don't have to stretch something just to make it something. Right. Yeah, we've had some um, some interesting experiments with that as well. And one thing that I'd be curious um, to hear from you guys if, uh, is sort of how, if you do get these other, if you really want to showcase the film, how do you make sure that's the flagship of the film and that the other assets that you're creating for it, for example, like we have incredible writers who will write like, you know, just like kind of a home runs on the topic, and how do you get them to not cannibalize the film and actually just like build um, build audience for yeah. the film? Well, I would say your pre like for us the premise, and it's funny to use that word because we say nothing cannibalizes anything else. Mm -hmm. We just believe that like we're all in this river of content, mm -hmm. and that nobody's really seeing anything. It's you're all living our lives and then trying to watch stuff. So. We, t we tend to think that if somebody does love something, they'll be a super user and they'll listen to the podcast and the short. And so we don't, we try not to think about cannibalization in that way. Well, I, th well, I think the best example is what 
the Optox does. I mean, I feel like, you know, for our film Free Solo, we had a standalone short story, mm -hmm. which, I mean, Free Solo was kind of a unicorn. It was everywhere. Mm -hmm. But that short mm -hmm. helped, for sure, bring a different audience or new sets of eyeballs to that film. So I think they can't hurt each other. That's you know? a really good point. It actually, so Free Solo would be just for broader context. So Free Solo was obviously the amazing um, feature. And then they, the filmmakers came to us with a short. And so we published that as an op doc that was kind of more of like an interrogation of the ethics of filming your friend <laughs> while you know that he may kill himself. Um, <laughs> it was really interesting um, and kind of like a behind the scenes, but a great standalone film as well. And then right after that, our columnist, Brett Stevens, who um, is a very conservative voice for the New York Times. Um, but he wrote a really, really glowing column about Free Solo. And it was just an example of how if we'd only thought that maybe he might want to write it, it could have been a really, it almost could have been newsworthy in its own right to have him kind of buttressing a film um, and, you know, talk. And anyway, it was like an example of how just it could have been. So we should all be talking more. Exactly. Really? <laughs> yeah. But it was more publicity for the film anyway, just not strategic. <laughs> It was organic, like Adam said. Um, we haven't mentioned uh, that there's the new platform that's being much more technology driven. Do you know what I'm talking about? Disney now? Plus? Oh, no, something else. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the, the, because since we're in short form, they are ultra short form and small screen. I'm talking about Kibi. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, thought it was a really unique concept. I, I just wanted to kind of pick your guys' brains about it since you're all here um, in this, and in, 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 uh, you know, enmeshed in the space, the fact that they have gone small screen in addition to small length in, and having that be the driver for the content. Um, and if you've ever had any thoughts around having like technology, I guess, being a driver for um, approaches to, to short form content. I think it's a great question. I think it is something to think about in terms of where it's going to be consumed. So I don't think we think about that enough. And I would love to find a story where it's like, oh, the phone is additive to this story. So that's something now that you've sparked that. I'm going to think about that. You know, Quibi, I think we'll know in April, right? I mean, that's when it comes out. You know, I think it's been surprising to me that they haven't commissioned a lot of short films. It's all been larger things cut up into smaller chunks. Um, and you know it's gonna be another service that's five bucks a month so we'll see how consumers do with that but they've certainly it's been good for the community I know lots and lots of creators who have sold things through and I'm kind of for anything that allows more stuff to be made here here yeah, I mean, I think for us, we're um, we're not necessarily making film for the platform right now, but it's certainly something that we're continuing to think about. We're certainly watching where people come to our stuff, and um, but as of right now, we're just in, in kind of making decisions off of you know how we continue to promote it, like which screens. But we're certainly working for screens of all sizes. It just makes me feel old. <laughs> really, <Stop>. um, <laughs> no, I, I admire what they're doing. Um, I, I'm traditional. I want to see my films on a big screen, um, and, and 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 it's great that you know Nacio. We're kind of taking a much more traditional approach on how we release films. Of course, we're embracing digital. I don't know what I feel about short films, but I know that they're smart because it's going to attract a younger audience, um, which is something that we all have to think about. Yeah, I mean, and but we'll like you guys with. could be talking with like I think GoPro has been also kind of fostering uh, like a filmmaker community around their technology, and I could I could see that possibly being like Nat Geoist, you know, Christine. Yeah, I truly don't know. I'm actually very curious what will happen because. Yeah. I haven't heard a lot of demands from people like, I would watch short films if I could watch it on my phone, but <laughs> yeah. I, because yeah, a lot of them you get, actually can um, already, but you know, uh, it's a little different because from what I've heard, a lot of it is celebrity and personality driven. Mm -hmm. So that will certainly pull people in that might not seek out other, you know, short form content. So um, yeah, the question is, you know, how many services and which ones will people be willing to pay for? And I think if anyone could see in that crystal ball, we'd be billionaires. But um, certainly I agree. If it gets more content made by good filmmakers out in the world, I'm for it. Except for I don't know about cutting a feature up into parts. I'm a little bit dubious about yeah. that. Yeah. 
also like what Christine said is very true, which everyone should remember. Nobody knows anything. So just <laughs> whoever you talk to, it, it is all bullshit. <laughs> All right, I just got the sign for audience questions, so we're gonna turn it over to you guys for questions you have for our panelists. Uh, can you just shout out, because it is really hard to see. Just go ahead. So the question is, at what point do you engage with emerging filmmakers? Um, I can just speak to the opdocs process in general, which um, it's, it's not going to be the most um, financially advantageous um, <laughs> uh, situation, but it's like we typically will engage in a, in a really constructive way once we see a rough cut um, or some sample footage, because that's going to give us the idea, um, or you could give us an idea an idea of what you're proposing and uh, another film that stylistically references it. But I think the biggest hurdle when you're an emerging filmmaker is that people haven't heard of your work and don't know your filmmaking style. And so, and that's really what's gonna be the difference. Like, um, you could have an amazing idea, but if it isn't being executed in a way that's gonna work for our platform, um, it, it wouldn't be a good use of your time to kind of like ha go down a path of talking about the idea. We wanna see like the style of how you're gonna make it. And so, again, a rough cut is the best way to do that, but failing again, having the resources, um, something that you've done before. Yeah, I, I think for us, you know, we still love good paper, good treatment. That's zero dollars, you know? Like, so if you're, if it's just an idea, you know, well, I want more than a paragraph then, you know? I mean, you can get, and I don't need a flashy deck with a designer and produced, you know, glossy thing. I just want like a really cohesive, really smart, really well thought out. You've looked at other things that have been out in the marketplace. You know, I don't ever want a pitch where if I spent a half hour on Google, I could get 95% of the information that was pitched to me. You know, I want somebody to pitch me something that I, I kind of can't find on my own from behind a computer. So yeah, I would just say, and if you're uh, younger or more emerging on the scale, then over prepare and over, over deliver in, in the kind of materials. But I think for us, if someone gives me really, really good paper that lines up and then we kind of pride ourselves at 30 for 30 and that we'll do the work. We will watch your previous films. You know, we will, uh, if you're pitching based on a book, we will read the book, you know, so we'll, we'll dive into those materials. And I think it really shows when you're pitching something in how much time and effort and thought you've put into it by what you're presenting. Um, and so also what you uniquely bring to it, right? If you're sure. the only one giving this information, then they need to work with you to get the story. Yeah, I think, especially if you, I mean, first of all, there's, there's, um, multiple points of entry for us. I mean, I think all of our teams are super accessible. We don't have huge, huge, t uh, you know, departments. So it's easy to be in touch with us, first of all. Um, and we're, I think we're all approachable and admire and respect and want to work with, with emerging filmmakers. The last thing you want, though, is a no, right? So, so I agree with Adam. It's presenting yourself as a professional with a fully thought out, original, unique, um, story that wants that and that's that's your foot in the door really for us so you know make us want more make us want to have a conversation when you you know again it's you don't want no so you want to come to us when you're ready um and that that could turn into a let's have a conversation let's talk about next steps or it could be a keep me posted which is not a no so you just don't want to know so just you know it's 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 it's, it's the best opportunity for you to impress us. 
And I'll just say in terms of when we come into the process, um, it kind of varies. Um, we might come on when there's no footage available whatsoever, or we might come on when you've already shot a lot of the film, but you need to you know, get your last shots and get an editor and get it made and get it out in the world. Um, if you're very early in the process and what you're pitching is, say, a character that you have access to that you think is amazing, we might want to put some development money in to say, like, let's see this person on camera to see if they really are amazing and to see if, you know, it is the access we're hoping for. So there are a few different ways, you know, to go about it. But I agree, always lead with what your um, unique sort of in is and what, you know, you've done before that's prepared you for this. And um, yeah, a lot of times keep me posted is the answer because we might not be able to make it right now or we might not be quite ready to commit based on what we've seen, but we're intrigued, so yeah. Yes, the front. Just like you, you may already do this, but encourage you as you're out and about at festivals, especially some of the regional festivals, to reach out to the colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. I think that's an opportunity to start you know, bringing some new faces into the industry. And while it's tough to take a chance on a young college student to do a feature, these shorts may create some opportunities. So mm -hmm. as you're at these festivals, spend an extra day and go visit a campus. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's part of why we have the Doc NYCU uh, showcase here. We bring in uh, universities from around the area, their students give platform to their students, they get a badge so they can be in the mix and, and, and meet these industry makers. I, I can't see. <laughs> if anyone has a hand up, just. Blind. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, for us, it just because, as you said, people are coming to ESPN for a very particular thing. So, our our viewer habits for our shorts just mirror, you know, less people, but mirror the the overall network, which is a little bit more male. But I will say, you know, our favorite comment always is when people say, "Oh, I don't like sports, but I love Thirty for 30. So that's yeah. like our favorite thing to get. And so we hope to be the kind of um, co-viewing or you know, bring more people under the tent. <laughs> um, for OpDocs audiences, uh, well, the General Times readership does tend to be um, older and more male. And that's something that the New York Times is really trying to um, rectify to bring in you know, younger people and, of course, more women um, just for the sake of the, um, the future of the paper and um, its revenue models. Um, and uh, t um, Opdox viewers do tend to be um, significantly younger and significantly more female. And so um, I think that's part of because they're women programming it, um, uh, in addition to a, a great guy. Um, and uh, I think that's been looked at as um, something that's great for exposing the brand to um, people that may not necessarily think of the Times as a destination or someone that's like making content for them. Um, and I think that's really been looked at as a way to kind of habituate um, and expose people to the Times brand in general that may not necessarily consider themselves to be like usual suspects. And the, the move for us is to try to get people to really love unexpected products from the Times, like OpDocs, and then maybe that will encourage um, other people to subscribe. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have enough data yet to say I've learned anything specifically, because we've done only, you know, um, a few shorts thus far um, that have gone up on, you know, aired on the network. But um, what I will say is that I think in the doc world, we talk about all these new platforms a lot, but there is something different to be done when you air it on a network, it's sort of this idea of what can we lead into it with that those people may be watching something that they're already, you know, totally hooked into and then will we, you know, be able to use that to lead into something that they're gonna be interested in and keep watching. And so that actually is an advantage of, of being able to air it on 
um, a cable network and you know so we're always learning about you know the best way to schedule something in that sense and then um, I would say I'm sort of just amazed at how big the audiences are getting for shorts um, you know especially um, with the all the streaming platforms they're really is an appetite for it. Um, and that may be because people have gotten used to watching short form with YouTube and everything we've had for the last decade or so. So um, yeah. <laughs>